Classic 1974 study getting a job. Grand Overall looked at several hundred professional and technical workers from the Boston suburb of Newton, interviewing them in some detail on their employment history. He found that 56% of those he talked to found their job through a personal connection. Another 18.8% used formal means, advertisement, headhunters, and overly 20% applied directly. This much is not a surprise. The best way to get in the door is through a personal connect contact. But curiously, Graham Weller found that of those personal connections, the majority were weak ties of those who used the connect contact of final job. Only 16.7% saw the contact often, as they would if the contact were a good friend. And 55.6% saw their contact only occasionally. 28% saw the contact rarely. People weren't getting their jobs through their friends. They were getting them through their acquaintances. Why is this? Grand Battle argued that it's because when it comes to finding out about new jobs or for that matter, new information or new ideal, weak ties are always more important than strong ties. Your friend, after all, occupy the same world than you do. They might work with you or live near you and go to the same churches, schools, and parties. How much then would they know about you don't know? Your acquaintance, on the other hand, by definition, occupy a very different world than you. They are much more likely to know something than you don't. To capture this apparent paradox, Grand Battle coined a marvelous phrase. The strength of a weak tie. The strength of a weak tie. Acquaintance, in short, represents a source of social power, and the more acquaintance you have, the more Powerful you are. Connector like Lois Weisberg and Rojo Hako, who are the master of the weak tie, are extraordinarily powerful. We rely on them and give us access to opportunity and what to which we don't belong. The principle holds of more than just jobs, of course. It holds holds of restaurants, movies, fashion trends, or anything else than movies by word of mouth. It isn't just the case, the closer someone is to a connector, the more powerful or the wealthier or the more opportunity he or she get. It's also the case that the closer the higher or a product comes to a connector, the more power and opportunity it has as well. Could this be one of the reasons Hoshi Fufi suddenly become a major fashion trend? Along the way from the East Village to Middle America, a connector or a series of connectors must have suddenly become enamored of them, and through their enormous social, social connectors, their long list of weak ties, their role of in multiple worlds and subculture, they must have been able to take those shoes and send them in a thousand directions at once, to make them reality. Hush Puppies, in a sense, then, got lucky. And perhaps one of the reasons why so many fashion trends don't make it into mainstream America is that simply by surest bad fortune. They never happen to meet the approval of a connector along the way. Halko's daughter Sally told me a story of how she once took her father to a new Japanese restaurant where a friend of hers was a chef. Hako liked the food, and so when he went home, she turned his computer, pulled up the name of acquaintance who lived nearby, and texted them note telling them of a wonderful new restaurant he had discovered and then they should try it. This is in a nutshell what word of mouse is. It's not me telling you about a new restaurant with a good food and you telling a friend that friend telling a friend. Word of mouth begins that somehow along that chain, 
So man tells the person like Roger Hosho. 5. He would then use the explainer for the four rivers. Midnight Ride started the uh, word of mouth epidemic and William Dawes Ride did not. Paul Lebera was the Roger Hosho of the Royce Weisberg of his day. He was a connector. He was for example. Gre Gregorius and intensely social. Henry died. His, his funeral was attended in the word of the of one contemporary newspaper's account by troops of people. He was a fisherman and a hunter, a card player, a shooter, lover, the frequent pubs and successful businessman. He was active in the local and Masonic lodge was a member of several select social clubs. He was also a doer, a oh, man blessed, as David Hecke, Fisher, recounted in his brilliant book, Paul Lebel's Ride, it was an uncanny, uncanny genius for being at the center of the event. Fisher writes, when Boston imported its first street right in 1774, Paul Lever was asked to serve as the committee that made the arrangement. When the Boston market required regulation, Paul Lever was appointed its clerk. After the revolution, in a time of epidemics, he was chosen health officer in Boston and coroner of Sulphur County. County. Sulphur County. When a major fire ravaged the old wooden town, he helped to found the Massachusetts Mutual Fire Insurance Company, and his name was first to appear on its charter of incorporation. As poverty became a growing problem in the new republic, he called a meeting that organized the Massachusetts Charitable Mechanic Association and was elected its first president. And the community of Boston was shattered by the most sensational murder trial of his generation. Paul Lever was the chosen foreman of the jury. Had Rivier been given a list of 250 surnames drawn at random from the Boston Consensus of 1995, there is no question he would do had scored well over 100. After the Boston Tea Party in 1993, when the anger of the American colonists against the British rulers began to spill over, dozens of the committee and congress of angry colonists sprang up around New England. They had no formal organization established means of community. But Paul Lever quickly emerged as a link between all those far-flung revolutionary thoughts. He would literally ride down to Philadelphia to, or New York or up to New Hampshire, carrying messages from one group to another. With Boston as well, he played a special role. There were, in the revolutionary years, seven groups of Whigs, revolutionaries in Boston, comprising some 255 men, most of the men, over 80%, belonged to just one group. No one was a member of all seven. Only two men were members of as many as five of the groups. Paul Lever was one of those two. It's not a surprise. Then, then when the British Army began the, its secret campaign in 1994, to root out and destroy the stores of arms and ammunition held by the pledging, pledging revolutionary movement. Never became a kind of an official clearing house, an official clearing house for anti-British forces. He knew everybody. He was the logical one to go to if you were a stable boy on the afternoon of April 18th. 1775, and overheard two British officers taking, talking about how there would be hell to pay on the following afternoon. Noah is surprised then when Leverer set out for Langston that night. He would have known just how to spread the news as far and wide as possible. When he saw people on the road, he saw 
naturally and irrepressibly social, he would have stopped and told them. And he came upon a town, he would have known exactly whose door to knock on, who the local military leader was, who the key players in town were. He had met most of them before. And they knew and respected him as well. But William Doy, teacher, find it inconceivable, inconceivable that those could have ridden all 70 miles to Lanston, not spoken to anyone along the way, but he clearly had none of the social gift of a liberal laborer, because there is almost no record of anyone who remembered him that night. Along for laborers' northern route, the town leaders as company captains instantly triggered the alarm. Fisher Wright, on the suddenly circuit of William Darby, that did not happen until later. In at least one town, it did not happen at all, though it did not awaken the town fathers and mili militia, military commander in the town of Knoxbury, Brookline, Watertown, and Watertown. Why? Because Knoxbury, Brookline, Watertown, and Watertown were not Boston. The doors in all likelihood of men in the normal social circle, which means that, like most of us, once he left his hometown, he probably wouldn't have known whose door to knock on. Only one small community along the doors ride appeared to get a message. A few farmers in a neighborhood called Watam Farms. But alerting just those few houses wasn't enough to tie to tip the alarm. Word of mouth epidemics are the work of connectors. William Dow was just one ordinary man.